Francis Mitchell. I work for Dalman. Uh, so just to give you a very brief overline of who Dalman actually are, we're a product design consultancy. So we've been in business for the last 25 years. We design physical products for companies from multinationals to SMEs, entrepreneurs, research institutes, everything. And we work across a number of industries. So primarily it would be fast moving consumer goods, ICT te telecoms, te technology and medical devices. Um, but just to give you a quicker overview, and because sure, we just had a marketing talk, I'm going to play you a very quick video which gives an overview of what we do from our 25th birthday celebrations. Very short. value that creativity and design can add to your company, your organization, what it is you're producing. Um, and so, does anyone actually agree with us? Um, quite a few, I would say. So we would, how we work and how we do what we do is influenced by an awful lot by best practice, current thinking in a number of different areas. So I'm sure you've seen some, if not all, of these books which talk about business model innovation, creativity and its importance. Uh, the sprint methodology from coming out of X Google guys, um, design thinking, designing for growth, all of these kinds of things. And fundamentally, they are aligned around the same thing. Who is the end user? Thinking about the people at the end. So, have any of you seen this? So this is the business model canvas. It's a tool that's used quite a lot now, certainly in startups, but more and more in businesses, which is helping companies shift the focus of their business model to ensure more success. You can download this template from free from businessmodelgeneration.com, but it's just a very useful tool. And what it does is help you build an approach to your business, making it more of a consumer focus. So traditionally, people would have focused on the building of their business around, I have a great technology, it's deadly, let's go out and sell it, which would be the same as the previous speaker was talking about. The new way is actually think of your end user. And I would be speaking a lot with primarily entrepreneurs on a regular basis where they have a great idea. And it's all fine and good having a great idea, but as I would friendly joke with them, just because your granny thinks it's a great idea doesn't mean it's going to sell. So you have to do an awful lot of market research around the needs of the end users. Is there a market for this new technology? Does it make sense? Perhaps the technology is brilliant, but it's not appropriate for the industry that you're thinking of. So this is just a tool that helps you think of what is your value proposition for which consumer segment, what kind of relationships and channels are you going to get to them with, and then you're looking at different elements of your business. So when we're designing products, we would ultimately feed what we do into something like this. You're pushing on people to think differently about how not only they develop a product, but how are they going to sell it. And when, this is also tied to, I guess, integration of technology. So we would have said a long time ago that our core industry areas would be ICT telecoms and fast-moving consumer goods. 
with the advent of technology, sensor-based systems, microelectronics, all of this kind of stuff, everything's converging. So it's really hard to say what you're doing sometimes because we're developing medical devices that are, actually medical device companies are still a bit afraid about the connected end of things because of data protection and the fear of hacking of medical devices. But the devices that we are designing are ready to be enabled, so they're future focused. So we've a number of, say, home care devices for people with chronic illness, not yet Bluetooth enabled, but there's space in the pre-manufactured device for integration down the line once they've overcome the technology problems around integrating and smart, the smartifying of technology. But you can see it in fast moving consumer goods, as well as smart packaging end of things. How can you be smarter and more savvy with making your phone work for you more in relation to fast moving consumer goods? Or ICT and connected health, so you're looking at a big problem in healthcare is taking people out of the hospitals and treating them more from home and capturing things early. So how do you integrate all of those things in? So these are things we're seeing a lot with our clients, and a lot of it is down to taking this technology. This technology is great, but where are you going to use it? Um, another thing that we sometimes happen, people are have a fear of the unstructured nature of creativity. Because when you can talk to some people, they're like, yeah, let's do a creative session. They're like, okay, yeah, post it, but where is it going? What are we going to get out of it? It's loads of fun playing with Lego, but what are we going to do once this session is over? And where we would see the value is in the process of creative thinking. So you probably see a lot of these different templates. So at the top is design thinking coming out of Stanford. This is the Darden Skill Theory. There's, there's a number of different theories and approaches. And we would be quite structured in how we do what we do as well. And when we're working with companies, what we do is apply a very structured approach to design. Discovery, develop, and delivery is very, very top line what we do, but the discovery stage is hugely important. And we're certainly seeing it in medtech. Uh, there's a lot more talk around innovation on the front end. How do we ensure that the device that we're developing is going to deliver? Because by the time you get to this point, which is designed for manufacture, you're just about to, to invest heavily in capital expenditure for the production of a medical device. So it's in the tens and hundreds of thousands of investment how are you sure that it's going to meet the needs? So we would work with uh, groups like the BioInnovate course in Galway, where we're teaching people to understand needs at the get-go. So you're in, you're observing surgeons, you're observing nurses, you're talking to clinicians, you're talking to hospital administrators, patient groups, all of these kinds of things. Because for a device to succeed in the medical industry, it has to hit a tick box for every stakeholder involved in healthcare. So this is the early stage work you do. So you develop a volume of different approaches, different solutions to the needs that you've identified. And then you go in, and this is actually quite a cyclical approach as well. You're refining ideas, you're coming up with prototypes, you're testing it with user groups. And that's not just specific to medical. It's really detailed in medical and really rich and really exciting. But we're seeing it more and more in other industries as well. How can you future-proof the success of your product by investing in this early stage work? And it's all about testing with end users. Who are the clients? Who are the people you want to sell this to? And can you get feedback from them at an early stage and integrate that into the design? So that's the kind of stuff. So in, in terms of giving you some examples, I've just some case studies that I'll fly through because it's sometimes easier to talk about examples of where we've worked with companies and what companies have done. So these guys are an Irish company called Motec and they took pre-existing technology that they didn't invent any new technology, they just packaged it well. Um, and it's a device originally for mobility impaired people and elderly users. So it was for fall detection. Uh, so if someone would have a fall, it would sense immediately and this device would communicate with them. There would be somebody in a call center who would find them, notify the emergency services, anything like that. But also useful for people with Alzheimer's, so you could predefine an area and should that person leave the area you'd be notified, a care worker would be notified, and you'd always find them. But the work that we needed to do around the development of this device was to develop something that people would actually use. Because it's all fine and good having the technology, but if you have someone who just doesn't want to use it, they're never gonna, it's never going to work. So previous to this device, it was the white box with the bed bubble. So you would have seen that a lot in the past. Elderly people with this big, essentially a sign around their neck that says, I am a sick and infirm person. So we went and we talked to a lot of different people. So the, the actual end users who they were trying to target, what would you like, what would you prefer? They're like, well, I don't want to bloody look sick. I have the latest iPhone, I'm pretty freaking tech savvy. I want something that looks kind of cool. So we developed 
a series of approaches on, around what might work. So there was neck-held devices. This was before the iPhone came out. We were very feature-focused with our, with our watches. But ultimately, it was a simple clip that worked well. Style on a small mobile phone, very simple. And what we worked as well with the, with the company themselves was to, this device is a simple clip, so it's about that size. But it's very easy for people with, say, manual dexterity problems. Very easy for them to push on. They can hang around their neck if they want. There's a button on the front that they can call someone anytime they want. It's a two-way communications device. But it also does all the work for you. But we worked with the company themselves to split the electronics between the two sides. Which they originally said wasn't possible, but we worked with them and we got it. Well, it got it going because it was important when you're working with the technology owners and the clients to push them. And if they come with a bundle of wires and say that's the working version, you need to be able to work in both ways to maybe adapt the functional prototype to work in the form that will work in the marketplace. So these are all things you need to consider and you need to consider them before you get to manufacture. So that device has become extremely successful for these guys. They got investment from Digicel, they're now all over the world, in the Caribbean, in Africa, um, and they're, they're exploring new markets as well because uh, it's also useful for people who work in extreme environments, say ESB workers who are working on high tension lines in the middle of nowhere. It's good for their employers to know where they are, should they have a fall, they'll be able to rescue them all and that kind of stuff. So they're exploring new markets, but it's a very simple tool, um, and it's, it's usually successful for them. This is another really interesting company, Novaris. So they originally designed this device up here, so it has a patented plasma system that cleans the air. So that was the original IP of the company. Basically, they draw the air of a room in, and it obliterates all bugs. So MSRA, uh, viruses, even smells, everything is just yeah, completely obliterated. And they have a partnership with NASA, and NASA has validated their entire system. So it works extremely well. So it's that final stage of cleanliness in healthcare. But what they discovered was the device itself works, they know it works. But when they put it into a healthcare situation, nobody else knew it worked. So there was a, there was a lack of reassurance or feedback from the device for the end users. So they were like, well, we don't know if it's working. What can we do? So we work with them to develop a, sense, a set of smart sensors around this. What has also led to massive investment in this company is now they have a data map of outbreaks. Um, so their kind of core market is the US market of, health, of um, homes for the elderly and, and, and infirm. And they have an entire map of every facility, literally room by room. You can see when there are peaks and troughs of outbreaks. It could be just a flu, but it can be MSRA. They can see that there's a peak when someone goes in and changes the bin. You know, there's different things that, that they could work on and improve so that they can reduce down. Uh, sorry. Uh, they can reduce the incidence of outbreaks. And they're doing extremely well. And because they have this data, and they've smartly integrated the data, they're getting a lot of investment. And in terms of haptic in interfaces for people, it's very simple, designed to blend into the wall of a building. And it's green, so you're happy. When it's red, you know it's something you need to notice. But it's not something that scares you when you're in a room. Because there's all these different things you have to think about. Sometimes you're designing to blend in and only be noticed when you need to be noticed. So those are the kind of things you need to think about for it to be successful. Now, I don't know if you know this device. It's fairly well known, the Moocall. So this is a, a great company that we've worked with. Um, and this is the device that attaches to the tail of a cow and allows the cow to text a farmer when a calf is arriving. So this is a great Irish entrepreneur who basically came up with the concept. He was farming, he lost a cow and a calf and said, there has to be something around this and had noticed a specific movement of the tail and went, there's something in that. He went and he got an innovation voucher, got a proof of principle because he worked with a, a research group to quantify the algorithm of movement of tail and then integrate in the communications technology. So they turned up at our office with a bundle of wires and went, this works, but we need a device that will work on a cow. So there you're investing in design by going out on the, like literally, this is the classic case we're in the field research. So we're working in extreme environments. You're in the outdoors, but you're also at the tail end of a cab. It's not a pretty place to be. And you're housing kind of very functional electronics. So the device itself has to be IP rated so that it o overcomes rain, hail, cow pads, and cow pee. It's not very pretty, but it needs to be done. It also needs to be a device that a cow can't knock off their tail You'd be surprised at the different range of conicality of tails with respect to breed of cow. You have to understand the hands of the farmer. They're not necessarily the most dexterous people in the world. They're a bit chunkier as they're outdoors all the time. So we're developing a device 
if there was angles on it, we discovered the cows would knock it off. So we're going for a form that is not easy to knock off. But at the same time, the tightness on the tail has to be regulated as well, because you can put off the blood flow to the tail. We used a very simple system that is the same as a ski boot ratcheting system. So very easy to do to adjust tension based on the thickness of the tail. Very easy on, easy off. And then it just is very visible. So the human eye can discern more shades of green than it can any other colour. And the cow was least offended by a green rounded thing on its tail. So this is the kind of research you're doing in the early stages. And the artery. Um, but they needed a, a device to deploy that rivet. So we developed this deployment device. So it's a disposable product for surgery. Um, but what we did is develop a device that is only three simple movements and you can do it. So you turn this handle clockwise and it deploys the first flange. You turn it anti-clockwise, the second flange is deployed. You pull a lever and it clamps shut on the inner and outer wall of the artery. And in clinical trials throughout Europe, they've shown that mean time to hemostasis has been reduced by 75%. Mean time to ambulation is almost zero and mean time to deploy is pretty much 17% uh, uh, quicker than anybody else in the market. So they've just been FDA approved. But what also has been a knock-on effect of this is it no longer needs to be a surgeon who does this. It can be a highly qualified nurse. So you're having knock-on benefits for the hospital system. You're changing approaches to procedures because you're understanding the environment, which means that the surgeon can move quicker on to the next surgery and have an increased throughput of clients, of patients through the hospital. So again, you're always thinking about end, end users and what's the best way of doing it. This is just another example to freak out. When you have a collapsed spine, um, we worked with this company where they developed a drill that would drill through at a curve into your uh, vertebrae. And this device then comes into the curve, deploys a, a mesh, you inject cement in and break it and take it out again and you immediately supported the, the vertebrae itself with uh, some bone cement filled mesh. And the reason this is good as well is very simple movements again, you put the, the complexity inside so that the end users find it easy to use. Another interesting thing is, I don't know if any of you have ever had bone surgery, it's kind of freaky, but bone surgeons love power tools. So it's, it, it can be very scary noise-wise. Um, but this is why it looks like a power tool. They kind of like that stuff. Um, another device again for Cook Medical, it's about observing, observing and learning from observation and interviews with surgeons. So this is for endoscopy, uh, endoscopy so a stent in, through the esophagus. And we were talking to surgeons, and surgeons never do anything wrong, which is fine. But you know, you need to tease out what's going on in the procedure. And once one guy said, sometimes it would be nice to reposition the stent. And when we dug deeper, we discovered that this kind of procedure is usually a day procedure and it's usually fine. However, if a stent is misplaced, it's open chest surgery three days in the hospital. So obviously a major problem should it happen. So we developed a simple mechanism that will allow you to deploy the stent halfway do a scan, be happy that the position is okay, continue the deployment, or retract and reposition. So you're saving on massive amounts of cost for the hospital. So they went from one shift to three shift down in every once that went, and they used it as a platform device. I'm running out of time, so I'm just gonna talk quickly about how you can work consistently through uh, with companies. We've worked with John O'Dee, which is originally um, Caradine, he's now Crossbon, very successful entrepreneur in Galway. He started with a respiratory device for neonatals. So they were originally just scary boxes. He was wanting to overcome technological intimidation in the neonatal ward. So we designed a ventilator for babies that looks like something you'd have at home. And it just is more reassuring for people in, in hospitals. Hugely successful. Bought out by Respironics in California. We continue to work with them on the development of a number of different respirators for mobile use and things like that. And then we develop a flagship device that ends up getting bought out by Philips. And then when Philips come along, they don't want to work with external design companies anymore, so we got the boot. But it was a nice story of progression with companies where you're really pushing the boundaries and assessing the needs of end users. And my final story, I'll be super quick because I don't have much time, but I decided to end on vodka because it's kind of fun and it's early lunchtime. So we work with Diageo quite a bit, and they come to us with a challenge, a problem from the super pubs that are over in London and places like that. And they literally said, it takes too long to dispense a double shot of vodka. Aha, what do you mean? And it means that, you know those massive big pubs, 10 deep at the bar, late at night everyone's having a double vodka and red bull. And it just takes too long because the standard way of dispensing vodka is through the gravity fed optic. So it, you know the, the bubble and you can see the vodka going down, air must be displaced before the next shot can be delivered. So this is a standard approach, very highly regulated, super highly regulated in British Isles. 
and you have to see it and everything like that. So a standard shot of vodka takes about nine seconds for a double shot. How can we reduce it and increase more throughput? So we did loads of ideas around potential approaches there, and essentially we ended up patenting a continuous flow pumping system for them, which allows them basically to put a glass under here, knock on this button as many times as they need a shot, and the shot will come out. But we had to work with the standards agency. Part of the standard for delivering of alcohol is that it must be visible when the shot is being dispensed. And obviously we couldn't show that in a pump. But we negotiated with them and we're allowed to show it on the screen. So you've got a marketing screen, but when the, when the vodka's being dispensed, you see vodka being dispensed. So you're overcoming that element of the, of the regulation. They also, literally one drop of vodka too much is too much and you won't, you'll be shut down. So we actually passed first time, which is quite cool. Because we did a lot of testing, we do a lot of iterations around it. But it also comes from dispensing pharmaceuticals and in drug delivery systems, we kind of know about accuracy and we've got a lot of flow dynamics innovations and patents in our back pocket for that kind of stuff. Um, but the nice thing is, uh, we've reduced it considerably, so it is officially the fastest uh, spirit dispensing system in the world. Double shot of vodka down from nine seconds to two seconds. Yeah. But it's not commercially available, it's not really um, advisable to push people to drink a silly amount of uh, alcohol. But it was tested, it was hugely successful. Um, and it's the kind of thing you bring, so that's why a lot of people outsource creativity and work with external consultants, because you get stuck. And that's what we're hearing a lot with companies right now, is you get stuck at that early stage of coming up with new concepts, that front end. And sometimes it's just that fresh injection of different thinking. We work across industries, we're pulling in medical to fast moving consumer goods, or consumer into medical, or ICT into bloody everything. You know, and it's just taking time to think differently will allow you to come up with products that will truly be for our competitors. So I hope that's been of interest to you. If you want to learn more, we have a stand, 1.9, and there'll be a talk again.